The Holy Spirit mysteriously came and went in the Old Testament, and this built great anticipation in his absence. This Pentecost morning, we'll see the longing of Moses' generation and know the fulfillment of their longing for the presence of the Holy Spirit because he's here. He's here. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11, beginning in verse 24. Numbers chapter 11, verse 24. Now the context here is likely the people of God within one year of coming out of slavery in Egypt. They should have been prepared to come into the land, come into a great land flowing with milk and honey, with farms and with land and flocks, everything ready to go, a turnkey operation. And yet, let us take a look at what happened. Verse 24. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Why is this happening? Well, the Israelites were grumbling against God as they constantly were in their wanderings. And in this specific case, they were grumbling about the manna, bread from heaven, they were angry about it. They didn't trust God. They thought he'd brought them out into the wilderness to die. And they looked back to Egypt and they said, oh, that we were back there. We had melons. We had onions. We had garlic. We had meat. And yet here we are out here roaming around in the wilderness and all God gives us is bread. They forgot the fact that they were to go into the land flowing with milk and honey, a promised land. And yet they grumbled and grun grumbled and so we see in chapter 11 and verse 1 here of Numbers, and the pe people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outlying parts of the camp. God showed his anger and judgment on, upon his people. They grumbled against him. They didn't trust him after he delivered them. Where? From slavery in Egypt. And he's bringing them into a good land. He poured out plagues on Egypt. And when they left, they plundered Egypt. The Egyptians said, here is our treasure. Go, go away. And yet here they are grumbling and fire broke out against them. The fire of the Lord came on the outskirts of the camp. This meant that fire came down and burned structures and burned people. The fire of the Lord came down and it brought death and destruction going on in chapter 11 and verse 16 here in Numbers it says then the Lord said to Moses gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them and bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand there with you now why did this happen I believe because the people not only grumbled against the Lord, they grumbled against Moses and the leadership. They were constantly saying things like, why is Moses over us? Who is this Moses? Why is Aaron a priest? Who is this Aaron? Why should he be priest over us? The same would have been said for these elders. Who are these elders that have been placed over us? What authority do they have? And so the 70 elders were brought to the tent of the meeting. This was the tabernacle and they stood around it. Now, they would have likely stood outside the outer court. So you got the tabernacle, this amazing tent where the presence of God with the people of God rests. And then you've got the outer court. You've got this barrier around the outside. Only the priests are supposed to be in there. So I take it that these elders arranged themselves around the outer court of the tabernacle. Let's see what's going to happen. Verse 25. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. God's glory cloud comes. His presence came down upon his house. The glory cloud that came down, this pillar of cloud that was with Israel, that came down on Mount Sinai that filled the tabernacle when it was completed so no one could go in there. The one that speaks with Moses. Did you know that the pillar came down in a separate tent? There's this other mysterious tent of meeting. Prior to the construction of the tabernacle, we read in Exodus chapter 33, verse 9, when Moses entered the tent, and we're told prior to that that he had a tent that he would pitch on the outside of the camp. 
And when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. Kids, do you remember this? Moses would go into the presence of God in this tent, and when he came out, his face glowed. He looked like he had light coming out of him, but in reality, it was the light that was put on him by the presence of God. And the people were frightened when they saw Moses' face, and so he had to veil it. Moses would go out, and God would come down in his cloud, but we see here the cloud coming by the power of the Spirit that was on Moses and only one other man. Moses had the Spirit come on him. Moses was the great prophet of old, you may remember that Moses was called the great prophet and that another prophet would come in his stead. Promised in the law, that's why. When Jesus comes, people are saying, are you the prophet? They thought Moses would come back in the flesh somehow. It was so mysterious. What did it mean? Because Moses was a great prophet and the Spirit came upon him, but there was another man that the Spirit came on in this age of the law. In Exodus chapter 35, in verse 30 it says then Moses said to the people of Israel see the Lord has called by name Bezalel son of Uri son of Hur of the tribe of Judah and he has filled him with the spirit of God with skill with intelligence with knowledge and with all craftsmanship isn't that interesting so the spirit comes on Moses and the other man that the spirit comes on is a craftsman an artist the one who's going to construct the house of God, the one who would oversee the construction of the tabernacle and the elements that go into the tabernacle itself, a careful person, a skilled person, and the spirit goes on Bezalel. So only Moses and Bezalel, but now what do we see? The spirit goes on the 70 elders to show the people who has God's favor and authority. And notice that the elders prophesied by the spirit Proclaim the things of God. Now, in the Bible, prophecy, as I've said before, means two things. It means to forth, foretell something that hasn't occurred yet, but it can also mean to foretell that which has already been said. I have no idea what they were doing, but whatever they were doing, I assume that it was recognizable to the people of God that God's Spirit was upon them. The Spirit came and they prophesied. The Spirit came and the 70 elders became prophets. The Spirit came and they proclaimed the things of God, but it was temporary. Notice here, but they did not continue doing it. Going on to verse 26. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the Spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. Seventy elders were to go out to the tabernacle, but two didn't go. I have no idea why they didn't go. Maybe they were sick. I don't know. But two of them didn't show up. But to show the sovereign and uncontrollable by men nature of God's powerful spirit, the two elders who did not show up at the tabernacle were also filled, and they prophesied by the spirit. What about this? So God said, you go out here to the tabernacle, you show up, and then God pours his spirit upon these elders, but two of them didn't go. They remained in the camp. And yet, just so, God poured out his spirit upon them, and they began to prophesy in the midst of the camps. It seems as though things are out of order here. It seems as though this isn't right, but the point is this, friends. God's going to do what God's going to do. God's going to do what God feels like doing where he will and where he wishes to do it. And friends, if we're a nation that will not turn back to our God, if we're a nation that will consistently wander further and further into unbelief, if we will continue to be a post-Christian nation, then God's going to do what God's going to do. May God pour out his spirit and turn Iran into a nation of prophets. Maybe God will pour out his spirit upon India and convert them. Maybe God will pour out his spirit upon North Korea and transform them into a nation of prophets. God's going to do what God's going to do. Can I hear an amen to that? Verse 27. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, 
the assistant to Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. A young man saw the two prophesying, and it didn't seem right. They're not doing things the right way. They're not there with Moses. They're not at the tabernacle. And we see that this carries over to Joshua. He's got concerns as well. Joshua is a good man, a righteous man. He also sits in that tent of meeting, by the way. Joshua, who will be the successor of Moses, has a problem with this. They're not at the tabernacle. They're not with Moses. They are prophesying out in the camp. Moses, do something. Let's go on to verse 29. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them, and Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Now if we take the lament here of Moses, oh, that all the Lord's people would be prophets and that the spirit would be put upon them and we turned it into a question what if all God's people were prophets and God put his spirit on them now let's take a look at our story here in Numbers chapter 11 you're probably thinking where's Pastor Craw going with this is Pentecost what are we doing hanging around here in the book of Numbers well look at the elements we have here we've got fire we've got prophets we've got the Holy Spirit We've got fire, we've got prophets, we've got the Holy Spirit, but it's all temporary. It's all waiting for something more. It's looking forward to something coming in the future. And guess what? That's the point of this. Why are these pyramids red? Why are we wearing red this morning? Because the fire of the Spirit has come on Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has come, but not in a temporary fashion. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. What do we have here? We've got fire coming. We've got the Spirit coming. We've got tongues of fire resting on people's head we've got fire coming not in wrath but in friendly fierce power kids you ever wonder why the spirit came with tongues of fire why didn't he just come with a a big blaze in fact sometimes you see these frescoes from churches and there's this big pile of fire and they're all kind of sitting around no tongues of fire came and rested on their heads do you know why tongues of fire rested on their heads Because the Spirit was coming and bringing fire to their mouths. The Spirit was coming and making them have tongues of fire. Uncontrollable tongues of righteous, holy fire. They're prophets. Going on to verse 4 in Acts chapter 2. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in their own language. The Spirit who came with destructive, death-bringing fire in the Old Testament to physical bodies is now bringing death and resurrection spiritually. The Spirit is coming and slaying this crowd as they come out of the upper room, and remember we saw the 120 going in the upper room, when they come out into the crowd and the Spirit is moving ahead of them, and now they're speaking with tongues of fire, and they're preaching the gospel. These people are being brought down to death and raised to new life. They're receiving new life in the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Spirit, and guess what, friends? So are you. So are you. I remember back in the day when my wife and I would attend a Pentecostal church, and people would come up and go, Spirit-filled? And even back then, it was like, what are you talking about? The Bible says all Christians are Spirit-filled. The Bible says 
Everybody who believes, believes because the Spirit has moved on them and the Spirit has taken residence up in them. Kids, when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God lives in you. Our friend, the third person of the Godhead, is a person, is not an inanimate force. Our friend, our counselor, our comforter, the Holy Spirit, takes up residence in our hearts. He fills us and he moves among us as the people of God. And he's here this morning. He's here. Moses said, would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them, and that has come to pass. He's here, the spirit is here, and we are a nation of prophets. Now, why do we not see the power of the spirit? By the way, it's not simply talking about strange signs and wonders. The power of the Spirit, when He moves, converts nations, brings kings to their knees, and raises them back up to new life. We're filled with the Spirit of God, and so what should we do? We should take the good news out into the highways and byways of central Texas and compel them to come into the body of Christ. And Pentecost reminds us that the Spirit is here. In the classic Akira Kurosawa film, the seven samurai. A Japanese village is abused and viciously ruled over by a large band of bloodthirsty bandits. Their situation is impossible because the village is weak, has no men trained for war, and the bandits steal their food, wives, and daughters. In desperation, the village decides to recruit ronin, masterless samurai, to hire them to save them. They find a wizened old samurai named Kambe and plead with him to come and help. But will he actually come? The villagers are nervous about the future, but suddenly Kambe and six other samurai are here, and now nothing seems impossible as Kambe sets about arming and training the villagers and preparing the village for battle in which they defeat a wily and numerous enemy. The church existed in the Old Covenant, but God's people lived in a transitory state as the Holy Spirit came and went in a mysterious and limited way so that the people of God often fell prey to the hordes of Satan who abused and viciously ruled over them like a band of bloodthirsty bandits and they longed for the Holy Spirit to be powerfully and permanently here. But the message of Pentecost is that in the wake of the resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon the community of warrior prophets, which is the church. We've seen this morning that the Spirit has arrived and that He's here. He's here. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have saved us, that you've placed us in the body of Christ, but you've also filled us with the Holy Spirit and that your spirit is moving amongst us and all of our brethren all over the world, and that your spirit is moving ahead of us. May we rejoice and rest in this truth and get busy in the knowledge of this truth. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.